So I'm going to talk about this library that I worked on called Dask Image. Um, various other people have helped along the way. Um, so I'm John Kirkham. And then if you don't happen to know my name, which seems to happen at this conference a lot, that's my GitHub handle. Uh, so for typical image processing use cases, uh, you think of something like commodity uh, photos from like cameras or something like this. You might be doing facial recognitions. You're trying to, in this case, take Biden, try to extract facial features, and then maybe apply like a Snapchat filter or something like this. Um, so the, these are generic images that are color, small, fit in memory, um, recognizable scenes. Anybody can look at that image and they know this is Biden, or at a bare minimum, there's a face if they don't know who this person is. Um, there are many algorithms that are already very successful here. When we think of large image processing use cases, the first thing we should think about is why actually are we collecting so much data? We're usually doing this for a specialized problem. We're interested in something like looking at microscope data of how cells are behaving, or the interiors of the cells, or we're looking at astronomical data. We have a specific question that we're asking, and it's usually domain focused. This data is large, so if we take a look at this particular video here, this is the AOLSM uh, data set. So this is actually looking here at a particular T cell that's going through and gobbling up different things. This is actually looking at structure that you can get out of this. Uh, so th this data set is like on the order of like tens of terabytes. Um, so quite large, not going to fit a memory. Uh, and this is like state of the art technique. So again, you're using specialized instruments you have data that's monochrome, multispectral, hyperspectral. It doesn't fit in memory. You need a domain specialist to even understand what the data is. In this case, you probably need several. You need a domain specialist to help you understand the instrument and any kind of issues you might run into there. Um, there are fluorophores that are added, so you need to actually understand how the fluorophores work. Um, you need to understand things about photo bleaching. And then you actually need the scientist who is interested in collecting this data in the first place to explain to you what's important about this. Um, and so you have a complex pipeline, not just in terms of software, but in terms of people organization. Um, so just to highlight that again, the data size is large, but the problem is also a knowledge problem. So let's take a look at some common workflows you might see here. So two common workflows might be a batch processing workflow. So I have a bunch of images. Each one fits in memory, but I have a lot of them. It might be a long video or something like this, for instance. Or I might have a large field of view. So this is a really, really big data set. I'm looking at really, really teeny chunks in it at any one time. So the batch, batch processing workflow, this is a pretty simple kind of thing. You can kind of imagine what this looks like. You go through each file in a loop. You do something where you load each chunk. You might clean up each chunk. You might do a thresholding and get a mask. You might do connected components. You might do other things in addition to this or even replace steps under the hood. These functions could be any sort of thing. And then you're saving out each result. If we're looking at the large image case, we'll just take one operation just so we can get a sense of this. We might take each region in that image and load that into memory. But actually, we can't just load that region. Our cleanup operation may actually need some surrounding region, right? Like if we're doing some sort of smoothing or something like this, we'll need the neighboring area as well. So we load actually a little bit more data than that. And then we do our cleanup operation on this larger piece. And then we crop that at the end and then save that result. And so we do this for each operation. So even though I've shown you just one for loop going through all these regions, we'll have this for every step in our pipeline. So now you get a sizable script from this. Uh, so what are the challenges with this? Well, first, it's not parallel with the batch case, but that's kind of obvious. We picked a for loop. But actually, when you start thinking about this a little bit more, that's actually a complicated question to solve. How do I want to parallelize this? Huh? Sorry. Bigger. Oh, OK. I can't hear. Maybe? No. <laughs> Sorry. You'll have to squint. <laughs> you don't really need to see it anyways. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yeah. So you go through, 
each file in this particular way, you might ch try to replace it with like multiprocessing. Okay, so that's fine. That works on your laptop. Now I want to run it on the cluster. That doesn't work. Okay, so maybe I change this up and I use my scheduler, right, for my particular cluster. Well, what if I want to test this on CI? Well, now maybe I have to set up a scheduler on my CI to actually test this thing. It's a mess, right? Even though that's like a really simple thing to say, this should be parallel, that's really hard to do correctly. Um, and that's just the first step. And then we have to also think about, are we going to combine all these functions into one operation that all happens together? If we do that, we have an additional problem. This is not inspectable. I can't see, like if I get to the end of my pipeline and I say, that result is garbage, I can't go back and see what happened earlier. I have to add save steps in the middle of all of these tasks, right? So now I have to run them all independently in parallel so I can see those results and go back. And even then, if it's wrong, I have to, what, rerun the whole thing or I have to add more logic to pause and resume at different locations. So this makes it even more complex. And then if I want to change an operation in this pipeline, well, you got to go rerun it again unless you have all that resumability code and all that sort of other stuff we talked about. So this makes it very hard if you want to experiment or try anything different. And then finally, I mean, this is obvious. It's batchable. It's not going to be interactive. So I just get to the very end, and this is really what we've been struggling with the whole time. Everything I've talked about, debugging, looking at results, trying to different things, actually is just failing because it's not interactive in the first place. So we need to think about how we solve that as well as part of this problem. <coughs> And then, of course, if we're doing this complex case of like a large field of view, you have already this bulky code, and now you're insorting, inserting more of that stuff that we were talking about before. All right. So what are the challenges? Every step that we try to fix here increases the complexity. Increasing the complexity makes it challenging to maintain. And that also makes it hard for new people to learn. So if I write this complex pipeline, I hand it off to a scientist, good luck for them figuring it out, right? Or if I need to take vacation for a week and I hand this off to somebody, they have to figure this out for themselves and I'm not there to answer the questions. And ultimately, if we need to write a totally different pipeline, this is mostly not reusable. It's just gonna get checked. So we want that original workflow. The workflow was right. But we need it to scale, we need it to be interactive, we need to be able to inspect things and debug it. So we used ask. I feel like I don't have to sell you on this here in a task image talk. <laughs> uh, so with Dask, uh, if everyone's familiar with Dask arrays, there's two particular functions you've probably encountered. You've probably seen map blocks. You may have seen map overlap, but we're gonna use these heavily. And we're gonna show you how we can build up functions that you can interact with. And then actually we'll say, these get taken care of for you in Dask image. So loading image data. So this is the first step. Instead of actually loading each chunk independently, we describe to Dask how we want to load this data and combine it into one large Dask array. Now we have an array that behaves kind of like NumPy and we can do NumPy-like operations. I won't dive into this in too much detail because there's already a blog post on it. You can take a look at that later. Also, slides will be available online so I can share those with you. So, batch processing. How do we fix this? Well, it turns out it's really easy now, right? We've loaded this all into a Dask array. We use map blocks. We apply that on each step. Now we can see that really cleanly, right? If we look down at the code that we had before, the for loop is gone. We're not saving at each step, but we could. We could save. We could select a small piece and compute it, and it would figure out the right logic in order to handle that. This will run in parallel anywhere we want. If we want to run it single-threaded, that can happen if we need to bug it. If we want to run it on our local desktop or something like this, we can do that. If we need to run it on the cluster in the cloud, we can do this as well. None of that code had to change. If we look at the case for large image data, we see it looks basically the same, right? So there's map overlap, map blocks before, that changed. You have the overlaps here, right? So you had to figure out what those should be. So that's a little bit of work. But this is the full pipeline versus this being one step, right? So this would have been a whole script, and here we're down to the same three lines. 
If we knew that we needed to handle even both cases, we could use this code for both the batch case and this case. So just to highlight, how did we improve this? We used map locks for the batch cases. We used map overlap for the large image cases. So are we done? That seems pretty good, right? Well, what about reusability? We still have this pipeline here where it's like very customized to that workflow. And how do we engage the domain specialists? We're using something that's a little bit more low level. Maybe people in this room are comfortable with it, but maybe people outside this room aren't comfortable with it. The answer is we make a library with a common API that people are familiar with. So let's take a very simple example. Let's say we want to smooth an image. So here we have this checkerboard. We might want to smooth it with like a mean filter and so we get something kind of like this. In reality, this might be a noisy image and we're trying to get rid of that noise. With the smoothing use case, we would have done something like this. We import SciPy ND image, we get the uniform filter, and we apply that on our data. We want to achieve that same API with Dask. So how do we do this? Well, we write a function. And so this uses the map overlap that we saw before. It handles the same arguments that you would have in SciPy ND image, good or bad. It matches it identically. Um, and we handle a little bit of cleanup of the arguments themselves. And at the end, we're returning this Dask array with this computation applied. So we can cover a wide variety of functions because there are many in SciPy and the image. So we can handle things like morphological operators. There might be some cases where we have to, the morphological operators need to inspect the intermediate results, so we don't handle these currently, but we can look into that if that's interesting. Um, Geometrical transforms we don't really cover, uh, but we do handle things like convolution. We didn't handle convolve 1D, but if you can do it in ND, you can constrain it to 1D, so that's fine. Correlation is covered. We can handle things on connected components on label images, so we can find things like extremas. We can find other features of those images. We can apply FOIA filters. Um, yeah, so there's a wide array of things that we can do. Of course, we don't cover absolutely everything because we added these based on need. So if there are other needs, let us know. Yeah. Let's see. Ah. Well, that's cool. Maybe I can highlight it. Is that better? <laughs> You can install it with Conda or you can install it with pip. It's called Dask Image. It's in Conda Forge. Um, so the next sort of thing that we want to think about is what sort of future work we want to do. Well, obviously, we want to fill in that table more based on need. Um, the next thing that we're kind of thinking about is how we could extend this to GPUs. So one thing that you might want to start playing with first is like playing with Numba. Numba makes it very easy to take arbitrary functions and create filters for them. Uh, if you combine this with SciPy ND images generic filter, or we also have generic filter wrapped, you could pass these number of functions along and compute as well. Um, there is some overhead there because you'll be moving maybe data that's on CPU to GPU, so it would be better still if we can avoid that and keep the data on GPU all the way through. Um, and then of course the other thing here I don't know who all is familiar with this, but there's the NumPy Enhancement Proposal 18. Um, and this basically adds the array function protocol. So this standardizes arrays across different libraries. So not just NumPy, but Dask, CuPy, Sparse, et cetera, can use NumPy functions. So if you called like NumPy max on a Dask array, it would actually compute with Dask. Um, or it would use a GPU to perform the computation on CuPy. So leveraging this protocol will help a lot as well. So. Questions? Have you been able to try that on streaming data directly out of a microscope or some other to give 
direct feedback to the scientists doing the experiments. <coughs> yeah, this is an interesting idea. We didn't try that directly. Normally we had large data sets that were saved to disk that we were working with. Um, but something interesting to play with there is uh, DAS supports async. Um, so that seems like the sort of thing to try in this particular space. But yeah, I agree. That would be the next logical place to go as well. I'd like to throw a question in. So um, how do you handle things like uh, labeling? I saw you had that covered where there's a lot of interdependence between the results in different chunks. Uh, you can thank Juan for that. He's somewhere hiding back here. There he is. <laughs> um, basically what happens there is we take each chunk and we take like one pixel around it for all of them and we run connected components on those. And then we select the boundary as well across both chunks and do connected components there. And from that, we get a remapping of how labels would match in one chunk to the other chunk and they use those to apply across the chunks. Very cool. And we could also look at things like watersheds and stuff like that. We haven't done that, but we've talked about it. So That's really neat. I can't see the head, sorry. Where's the head? Oh. <laughs> so how do you uh, calculate a uh, Fourier transform of a la large image? Yeah, so that's handled in Dask Array currently. Um, how it does this is it restricts everything to one axis. So if, if you want to do a Fourier transform along an axis, you must have that whole chunk in memory. Um, you don't necessarily need the other axes but you need that particular one. It would be interesting to think about how you might apply that FFT over multiple chunks so that you don't actually have this constraint. But thus far, like people have used this fine in practice. You, you re-implemented most of the functions in circuit image, well, lots of them. Any thought about a protocol-like array function for images so that circuit image could automatically dispatch to Dask image or Dask GPU or circuit image GPU if it became the thing? Yes. So there's actually an open issue on SciPy where we started discussing this recently um, about how maybe we could actually uh, leverage array function to dispatch between SciPy and DImage's existing API in this. So you could even just apply that directly on a Dask array and then it would work. Um, it gets to be kind of an interesting question is there are also other use cases where people want to try different FFTs that aren't array based that are more like they have different algorithms they want to try, right? Um, so there's something that we still need to figure out in this specific case. But yeah. That discussion's happening. John, mm. sprint. Oh yeah, we're we're having a sprint at the end. Uh, so if you guys want to come over and work with us on extending Dask image or generally large scale image processing, um, please meet with us. We're very friendly. <laughs> Any more questions for John? All right. Thank you very much.